Welcome everybody to this talk. I'm quite glad to be here. It's my first first conscious time in the States. I've been here as a child. I don't remember a thing. So for me to be in California and listen and talk about the things that I'm interested in feels really, really cool. Um, so thank, thank you for that. Mm. What I'm going to try to do now is talk about what I think consciousness is. I uh, studied at the Humboldt University in Berlin, nothing fancy, um, and I tried to figure out what was going on, and what you're getting today is my current understanding of the topic. Um, I, I base this, let's call it work, I don't not really work, but it's mostly based on the works that I've read of uh, one philosopher who's also here today, it's Joscha Bach, but also Thomas Metzinger, it's a German philosopher of mind, uh, Michael Graziano, Francis Egan, Stephen Wolfram, Nigel Cutland, and Immanuel Kant, Markus Müller, some of my own thoughts and some self-observation. Okay, uh, let's start this. So uh, what is consciousness? How can it be that the lights are on? What are we? These are the questions or some of the questions in philosophy of mind. And uh, as a, in a homage on the Turing paper, I would start the whole thing with answering these questions and therefore explaining consciousness should begin with the definition of the meaning of the terms explanation and consciousness. So I'm going to try to do that now, that you understand how I use the terms. Before we get there though, I think the puzzling thing to most people is uh, what you would call the feeling of what it's like. Yosha mentioned that in his talk three days ago, I think. Um, the qualitative aspect of experience. So how can this arise in a purely mechanical universe? Um, how can this arise without being already there in some sense. And to many people, this seems like getting something from nothing, which should not be allowed in any sound proposal, right? In another aspect, uh, often subsumed under the term consciousness is self-awareness and sentience, which will be addressed as well, but not, not uh, thoroughly. So this is the indexical definition. I took that from Yosha. It's just, there is some phenomenon that puzzles us, and I'm just pointing at it right now, but like when children point indexically at stuff, but I'm pointing at a certain experience, right? A further definition would be a system that perceives perceiving. Uh, okay, so consciousness as the feeling of what it's like. This is one we do, what we want to explain. Explanation, I would say, has two aspects. Um, how does something work? And two, not as important, but how did it come to, into existence? As in, how does a watch work and why is there a watch? And I would say that if you want to show how something works, you have to show how it can be constructed by the axioms of some descriptive framework. And the ultimate descriptive framework would be the atoms of our epistemology. I will get to that later. But don't be confused by the term atoms right now, because I'm not referring to a material thing or to a certain entity that is used in certain physical theories. I just mean the smallest unit of knowledge. And I also don't mean a philosophical definition of knowledge as justified true belief, just what is directly given to any kind of possible observer. That's the question here. And in the end, if I would want to try to explain in general what consciousness is, I have to be able to show how the phenomenon that I defined can be constructed from what is directly given, at least in principle. You won't get a detailed menu. I, I don't have one, of course. Mm. And once again, to many, the feeling of what it's like seems to be inconstructible. So you have to be a panpsychist, or it has to be fundamental, but that doesn't help you because this fundamental thing has to be explained as well. Mm. We have to get the atoms of our epistemology straight before building anything with them. And I recently discovered that uh, Kant seemed to be annoyed by this as well in his introduction to the critic of pure reason. He writes that, uh, but it is a common fate of human reason to finish its building in speculation and as early as possible, and then only to examine whether the foundations for it have been lay, uh, well laid. But then all sorts of embellishments are sought in order to console us with the prowess of the foundations or even to reject such a late dangerous examination altogether. So we have to get the atoms of our epistemology straight. Epistemology in general is the study of what can be known. And I rephrase that already as asking the question, what is directly given to any kind of possible observer? And let's look at us. We seem to qualify as observers. So what is given to us, what we have at our disposal, are different sets of observations generated by 
let's say, sensory perception or abstract thought, proprioception, inner feelings, but you could also subsume all the scientific measurement devices that we have, telescopes, particle accelerators, computers, and so on. They all provide us with a very large set of observations. That's our baseline, right? All you get is observations, and then you can figure out or try to figure out what these observations mean. I like to use the term phenomena or appearance when I talk about observations. I took that a little bit from Kant in some way, so I'm going to use it from time to time. Don't be confused by this. Um, appearances are not illusions in this lingo. That's very important. Some people seem to associate that. That's not what I mean. But just look at me right now. You have a certain appearance. Something is happening. You have a certain observation that has a certain meaning to you. And that's all the time the case. It just changes all the time. Right? I am, whatever I am, obviously an appearance to you right now, as are your current emotional states or your curiosity or whatever. Mm. Observations or phenomena and appearances have to consist of something. And yeah, I'm also taking something from Yosha, which is uh, all appearances and phenomena consist of discernible slash perceptible differences information. That's what I want to get here. I think to many people it's not directly obvious why you would be able to deconstruct observations or phenomena or appearances into information, you know, just measured in bits, just one discernible difference, ones and zeros. But think about it in this way, all phenomena are discrete, finite, and definite structures. For example, your experience right now. It's always evolving and highly complex and high dimensional, but it is in a certain way. Otherwise, you wouldn't have that experience. It could be anything, and you wouldn't be able to identify anything about it. Surely, you wouldn't be able to be puzzled about some aspects of this experience. So it is in a certain way. Um, so the structure of, the, of the, the experience consists of the perceptible. That's very important. If it's not perceptible, not discernible, it's not part of the appearance. So we have information as discernible differences, and we need to build up everything from this now. Um, it is the foundation of our epistemology. And of course, people entertain different epistemologies. Maybe you say, no, there's some fields that are fundamental, and I can know about this or whatever. But if you think about it, all these notions, field atoms or material objects, need information as well, right? You need to construct them somehow. They need to be some, defined in some way or constructed. So actually, every possible metaphysics that you have, or every possible epistemology in the study of what can be known, needs at least information and something on top of that. Right? Maybe that's also one way to look at it. Mm. So the foundation of epistemology is information. And everything else is actually constructed over the notion of information, right? Space, time, physical objects, material objects, atoms, fields, theories, colors, people. This is never directly given to you. You get a set of appearances, and you try to interpret the regularities of the appearances, and that leads you bit by bit to the notion of these entities. As a memorial to René Descartes, who had his uh, foundation at I think, therefore I am, in his meditations, he didn't formulate it that way in the meditations in another document. I think, therefore, I am cogito ergo sum, je pense dont je suis, sorry for the French. So my cogito right now, same argument would, I wouldn't go, would be, I wouldn't go so far as Descartes, but I would say there are discernible differences. This is directly given. Not everything is the same. That's what we can directly know. This cannot be an illusion as well, because this illusion would also need some kind of differences, because obviously not everything is the same. Now, for many people, this would not be enough to build anything from it, but at least I think we can agree that this is somehow the baseline. And every other baseline needs at least this and something on top, right? Whatever you say is directly given to you, or whatever you say that you can know. Summary again, I would argue all observations consist of a finite set of discrete bits, that means the observations are defined by what is discernible. All experience, we will get to, get to that a bit later as well, consists of a finite set of discrete bits. I mean the, that the structure of the experience consists of the perceptible. And all formal systems and abstract ideas consist of finite sets of discrete bits. The thought or the construct, the abstract notion, is of course defined by its concrete structure. It is nothing beyond that. Now, at first glance, this seems insufficient, because I think that in our culture, let's call it a materialist culture, we, do, we encounter the concept of information mostly as information about something else, something real, so to speak, that can be described. 
But in fact, this is not so, right? Information is more fundamental than the other entities. All you get is information and you can infer the presence or construct entities over the information. But the direct thing that you're also getting right now is not me, right? It's not my voice. It's a dynamic set of information that you interpret in some sense. That's very important. So epistemically, when it comes to the question what can be known, information is more fundamental than, for example, a material, the notion of a material thing, right? It's weird. We, we think it the other way around normally. But I think it's important to to address this. This also means, of course, that the notion of a physical universe is not given to you, right? All you get is sets of information, and you can try to encode this information. This is what most physical theories are, right? You have observations, and you start, you try to make them pre make predictable theories of how these observations will evolve if you observe further. We haven't yet found any theory, any encoding that encodes all the information that we get without contradictions, right? But um, we're trying to get there. But this also means that the physical universe or physical reality, because it's not directly given to you, is just a possible way to encode parts of the observations. It's just that the physical universe has been so successful that nowadays in philosophy we think that this is fundamental and we treat all other possible encodings of the information as theories about the physical universe. But the physical universe is actually in the same domain as these theories. They're all just possible encodings of the observations. Right, that's very important, because the physical universe obviously cannot encode everything. We get problems there. And now before I go on to what I want to get to actually, which means consciousness and self-models, um, is, is this all the result of some present-day thinking bias, you know, in the information age, digital age, we meet like in rich California and everything is now information and computation and whatever. And I think that's, I mean, at first glance it's a valid point, at second glance actually it isn't because computation is not tied to a specific machine or specific social media technology. Computation is an abstract concept. We just named certain machines that can practice this in a universal manner after the concept. But it's just, and Wolfram puts this nicely, uh, the discovery of a universal system of description and construction. It's very important, so it's very old. Greg Chayton uh, put it also in a nice way where he said, well, actually an epistemic commitment is a neo-Pythagorean stance in some sense. So it's not really a present thinking bias that's going on here when I talk to you about information that might be also relevant to note. And also, while solipsism is a possibility, I cannot really rule this out right now, what I mean here is not supposed to say, oh, it's all just in our heads and the world doesn't exist and blah, blah, blah. That's not what it's about. All I'm saying is that the world or the universe is not directly given to you in the observations. And you shouldn't assume it as, as well, but you can rationally infer it from the dynamics of the observations. I will give you an example later on. That's, that's all what it means. And actually, I think solipsism, you could rule it out inductively, I guess because I think the kind of the program I would need to encode the entirety of my experience um, would be shorter if it's just like a universe that gives rise to me at some point than encoding everything just like this, like a Boltzmann brain or whatever. Okay, for what this rational inference might be, one can look into Solomonov induction, which is basically about finding the shortest program that generates the observations that are given. Um, Markus Müller described it as follows, in contrast to the standard view Objective reality is not assumed on this approach, but rather provably emerges as an asymptotic statistical phenomenon. Or to put it in the words of my flatmate Dan, who just arrived, there is no spoon, there is only Solomonov's beard. I like that very much. If explanation means constructing the indexical phenomenon, the feeling of what it's like from what is directly given, then we have to now construct the feeling of what it's like from information. That's the goal here. So we are in the domain of computation, of systems that can produce universal, finite, and discrete patterns. So I mean, it's a, it sounds a bit simplified, but I think epistemology and metaphysics boil down to there are only discernible differences, and we can discover the principles of all possible discernible differences and relate them to each other. Now, normally discernible differences and their regularities are described by functions. And I like these logic puzzles because they show us something, right? Sometimes you get the series of patterns, and then you have to predict the next correct pattern from it. And you have to see if there's some kind of regularity between the patterns, because these individual states are always changing. There's nothing constant. But maybe you can find something that is constant within all the chaos. 
And that's normally captured by the function. So here we, for example, see that between every state in the upper row, the ellipses are color inverted, the mid circle is color inverted, the outer circle spin counterclockwise, and the like, line spins clockwise. And it's always the same change between each frame. So the frames are all different, but there is actually something that is stable, which is the abstract shape of the change between the frames. And this is interesting, because you can see this, you can find this, and then model this shape of change as some kind of entity, which we do sometimes in math when we draw something in a coordinate system. We project the shape of change onto some kind of token to make sense of it. And I think our subjective reality consists mostly out of these shapes of changes that are constructed sometimes as entities or events, and they are interrelated. And then we can look at the shapes of changes between the different shapes of changes and scale this up and understand more and find more regularities. Now, everything I talked about, let's try to apply this to some kind of thought experiment. Um, I'm going to use an analogy that Richard Feynman used in some kind of TV show. It's on YouTube. It's quite fun. I'm going to use it for something else, but I think it's really helpful. So, Imagine that we are a bug, or imagine a bug, generally, sitting in the corners of a swimming pool. And the bug has no eyes and no ears, it just has a set of antenna that are sensitive to, let's say, vibrations or fluctuations in the water surface. And now a person jumps into the pool, causing concentric waves to spread out, and droplets are flying in the air, landing, also causing their own wave circles. And moments later, the corner in which the bug is sitting is being disturbed by an intricate pattern of evolving wave interference patterns. So that's what happened, that's what's happening. And all the bug can do, because it doesn't know anything about a pool, doesn't know anything about itself really, is the antenna, and it doesn't know anything about the antenna by the way, they're just starting to vibrate and they send impulses into the bug's head, let's call it, or let's say the mind of the bug, whatever that is. So that's all the bug knows about the world, it changes in information, and if it wants to figure out what's going on, what can it do? Well, it can try to find regularities between the incoming impulses. The impulses in, in, in themselves are not interesting in the same way as these states are not that interesting. The interesting things are the correlating principles between the states that you can find. So what the bug could maybe do in his little head could figure out, oh, there's something coming in regular bursts, and maybe there's something that loses intensity, and then it can overlay this and says, well, whatever the word is, it's something in regular bursts that loses intensity, which kind of maps well to being on the surface of a pool where there's a wave pattern caused that slowly loses energy. And, of course, we are in some sense like the bug. We have fancy antenna, we call them eyes, ears, mouth, noses, and so on. But in the end, all we have is a fancy set of antenna that gives us a big, big vector of information, and we have to find regularities in this vector, so to speak. So actually, we don't have access. We cannot say anything about this, what's behind this. We just know that something, or assume that something is sending these patterns, because that's not directly given. Maybe they are just the patterns, who knows? Mm. And our perceptual or subjective world doesn't really look like this. It's a bit more complex, but quite similar. Mostly our subjective world is perceptual. So our mind is constructing a story about what is going on, but in a perceptual language, which is happening right now as well, right? You're getting a perceptual story of what is going on. Namely, the story tells you you are in a room right now, you have a self and some kind of body map, and you're observing someone who's observing you and listening to something. This is all clear to you without thinking about it. It's just represented in a perceptual multimodal language, which the mind uses to tell you what's going on, as if you were in the swimming pool right now in the corner, so to speak. And I found a nice illustration of this Amazon Studios theatrical logo, how this perceptual geometric language is like just a set of discernible differences that is arranged into a form in which you can figure out what is going on, right? You have obviously kind of opened up the book of the perceptual language, and it's constructing and updating in real time like a complex model to you of what is currently going on. This is your version of the bug's version of the pool, so to speak, right? That's what's happening. So percepts are obviously a language. Mm. This language is sometimes a bit weird to us, and I think rainbows are a good example to think about this, because normally we think they are objects and events, and sometimes it's weird because some things are in between, and rainbows are such a thing, right? Most of us find them quite beautiful, and when we grow up, we always want to get to them, and then we realize, oh, we can never get to the rainbow, why is that? 
And then maybe we get told, well, it's because the rainbow is not out there, it's just in our mind. Out there is just something that's happening that can be described as a lot of raindrops falling in a specific angle, getting hit by sunlight of a certain spectrum relative to an observer. So there's a complex thing that's happening, and we get a simplified statistical abstraction of what is happening. This is the rainbow, like almost like an object. And the rainbow is, of course, not the drops, and it's not the light. It's more the dance between the light and the rain. It's once again the relations between the patterns. And as I'm telling you this right now, of course, I have to say that rain and sunlight are also rainbows on a different level of description. Right? It's not that they are really raindrops and we are getting the rainbow because it's models, the raindrops, the raindrops are just another model that we project into the data stream. But maybe it helps, these weird things, because with the rainbow, I think we understand it, but when I tell you that your own self or this chair or this piano here is also a rainbow in that sense, it's the same simplified statistical abstraction, to most of us it's a bit counterintuitive. Um, yeah. So I would say the rainbow is an artifact of the shallowness of our world model, and we like it very much. And I would also say that most of the confusion in philosophy of mind results from intuitive ontological commitments to artifacts of the shallowness of our world model. All right. Now, if we just have these patterns between information, where do we get the meaning from? Meaning is obviously some kind of part of our subjective experience. And many people um, say that meaning is derived by some kind of reference to the outside world. But that's not possible. You cannot actually reference the outside world. We just talked about the fact that the outside world is not given. You can just infer it. So whenever I talk about the outside world, I'm just pointing to a concept in my space of models, which is what you are doing as well. And even if you say, yeah, but, but this model is referring to some outside world, this is again a model in my mind. You cannot really get out of this. You can make this recursive loop just go on and on, but nothing will accelerate this loop fast enough that you can actually point out into another system. It just doesn't work. But what you can do is actually, within your own formalisms, you can discover the abstract notion of an outside. You can just realize, oh, things can be outside of something else. And you can apply this meta-concept of something outside of something else to everything in your concept space, including to all of your concept space. And that's how you might derive the notion of an outside. But it's not reference. It's actually looking in your own formalisms onto possible combinations of something outside of something else. Or you could also realize, hey, I fulfill the uh, sufficient conditions for an observer. I can look at the set of all possible observers and then have a class of possible observers. And they have as a conceptual necessity the fact that they are paired with some substrate. And then I can figure out, OK, I am an element in that class, or at least it applies to me. I have to be paired with some kind of substrate, and then I can derive, okay, what I mean with the notion of the universe is just the first part in the ordered pair of substrate observer in which I look at myself. And I don't know what substrate I'm paired with, but I can tentatively reduce the number of possible substrates by observation. For example, our universe seems to be Turing complete and information preserving, so maybe substrates that don't have this ability might not be paired with us. But you derive the notion of an outside within your own formalisms. You never point there. And evolutionary, it's interesting that our mind has done exactly this already, right? Our mind represents itself naturally, all on its own, as an observer of an outside world. That's what the perceptual language is telling you all the time, doesn't matter what you do, actually. But in fact, of course, the self, the outside world, and the relation between self and outside world are all models inside the formalisms of the mind. And the difference between reality and appearance occurs at the level of appearance. It's a sentence I like by Thomas Metzinger. Der Unterschied zwischen Realität und Erscheinung tritt auf der Ebene der Erscheinung auf. Or in other words, I would say the notion of a territory is part of the map. Meaning, if it's not derived by pointing to an outside world, how does it work? Well, I would say it's very simplified, but if you have an observing system that contains a finite and discrete set of information, then it means that within that system or within the model of that system, every piece of information has a very specific, specific set of relations to all other pieces of information. And I would say tracking this relationship dynamically and updating it is what meaning is. So it's, it's kind of the model, because you cannot actually model all the relations to all other pieces of information all the time, but meaning is the modeled set of relations of a piece of information to all other sets of information within the systems model, which works. If it's finite and discrete, then every piece of information has a distinct set of relations. 
And I think this is why meaning is implicitly so clear and it's always there. But if we think about it explicitly, then it becomes so evasive because then we actually try to just look at the set of relations which we might model as some kind of abstract shape, a gestalt, so to speak, and we can't really grasp it. A little insertion, which is also important. When I talk about languages, I'm talking about constructive languages here, not indexical ones like our natural language. I could not build the feeling of what it's like easily from this because it's pointers and the pointers are empty if they don't point to something. Right, so if I write down the square function on a piece of paper, I didn't implement the function, my mind has to do it or a computer has to do it. But if I manipulate a piece of paper or transistors in a way that they actually implement the function, so implement the shape of change that is described by the function, change the universe in a way that it makes these changes happening, then I actually did that and I need this constructive language. So when I talk about a perceptual language, in the end that might feel like something, I'm not talking about an indexical language that wouldn't work, right? Mm. So yeah, a, a model written in a perceptual language that feels like something and has inherent meaning can't be written in pointers. It has, has to be written in embedding relations. Now control and regulation, what you see here is the Watt governor was invented before that, but James Watt made it famous and kind of better. There's been inverse relation with spins. These balls are lifting up by the centrifugal force and uh, make the valve close. And so that regulates the energy input and therefore the operational speed of a steam engine. We could also just say the driving speed of a steam locomotive. And this is a pretty good controller, but it only is able to react, so to speak. Just, you know, and sometimes when disturbances come along that completely change the trajectory of the steam engine or make it halt completely, you won't be able to get it driving again. So it's just reacting. And the thing is that if you find yourself in a universe with rising entropy, or if we don't want to speak directly about the universe, let's just say you realize that entropy is a fact that you see in any computational data stream that's incoming, then you realize that complex systems can only persistently exist if they have some means of stabilizing their structure. And in, let's say, planetary systems or with planets, that sometimes works if there's a local dominant organizing principle, which we call, for example, gravity. Gravity, gravity wells that limit the number of possible states that a system can be in and squeeze them into ordered movements and so on, or hydrostatic equilibria or whatever. So in these structures, you have dominant organizing principles that make them regular and keep them stable for a while. On our scales, the disturbances which we are confronted with are so complex that it doesn't need it's not enough to just react. We are not perfect gimbals, so to speak. That would be cool if you have like a multi-dimensional gimbal that could stabilize us completely just by reacting. So we need to proactively act. We need to act on the possibility of disturbances. This is what's happening. And that's why we have a concept of the future. You can only act on something that's there. If you want to act at a, I don't know, future disturbance, you have to construct the notion of the disturbance to figure out how you could, can act on this, on this uh, disturbance. So you have to act on a, on the danger of a set point deviation before it comes. This would mean that some train, for example, the governor, the watt governor, needs to be electrical, construct some models, and maybe before the hill, the ascent starts, it needs to increase the speed of the train to get over the hill, otherwise it wouldn't do it. And that happens all the time. The more complex the control gets, the better the regulation, that's kind of clear. And maybe a sophisticated electric watt governor would at some point, if it measures the rotational speed of the wheels and maybe the wind friction and maybe there's like some kind of spirit level measuring the current tilt of the, of the train tracks and so on, would be provided with a relatively big data stream and maybe it could derive relatively complex regularities from that. Maybe it's a circular train track and the tra train stops all the time and so it would have a notion of regular stops which kind of deviate the set point of the speed to zero and up again. So it would construct a more and more complex model and therefore be able to regulate more and more complex. Is this still clear? I kind of shortened that in a non-productive way, I realize. But I think the general notion is, is, still, is it still apparent or, or did I lose you on this? control talk. Who is still with me? Just a uh, just special offense. Who is not with me? Be honest. Okay. Um, okay, I'll try to go b b back on this a little bit. So imagine you don't have this watt governor, but an electric governor that is able to make models of relations between information, like the bug in the pool, right, to figure out what's going on. And then you connect this electronic governor to some input channels, for example, a spirit level or the rotational speed of the wheels or the friction on the hull of the train or whatever. So it gets a data stream. And then it can look like the bug at correlations between the data impulses, right? 
And it also has a set point value, like the speed of the train, and maybe it finds correlations between a decrease in set point value and certain patterns that are incoming. Right? Maybe when the spirit level changes the tilt, a certain data stream is sent in that represents the tilt, and then it will slow down. So every time this data stream comes in, the train will slow down and realize a correlation between this data and the set point deviation. So the next time this data comes in, it will just accelerate and avoid the set point deviation altogether. Was that a bit more clear how it could arrive? And so it does that more and more, and it finds more and more principles in the data, and it can regulate better and better, right? But as it does this, it will make changes to its environment, right? It will regulate the speed according to the expected disturbances. So if it goes on and on, there will emerge a new principle in the data, because there will be something new in the surrounding world that influences the data, namely a principle that is regulating the speed of the train because that's what the governor is doing, and it leaves traces in the environment, so it changes the makeup of the data stream. So it can discover itself as an appearance in the data stream as the principle that regulates the train speed, train speed relative to the predictive disturbances. And it has a simplified, statistically simplified model of its own agency, which might be the self, so to speak. I think that's what the self in the end is. So the self is an appearance that you can have in a recursive data stream loop that appears if you actually regulate the environment. Was that a bit better? Like now, who's with me now again? Okay, who's still not with me? Yes, okay. Maybe it's just American politeness, I don't know, but uh, thanks. All right, so yeah, maybe it derives a statistically simplified version of what it is and whatever, and it won't be close to reality. It's also not feasible. Um, but yeah, maybe, maybe this Thomas the Tank the series was about steam locomotives or what governors deriving a self model and interacting with the train world. Um, okay, and now finally, let's go to consciousness. Um, it will involve expressions of recursion, and expressing recursion in a natural language is a pain in the ass, because we don't have different words for the different loops and so on, um, and we end up with sentence monsters like, I know that you know that I know that you think that I did something stupid, um, which is a clusterfuck to decipher, but a completely normal perception state to be in. If that situation was the case between us, and I come in this room, we would know what's up, and we would talk it out without worrying, wait, what respective mental states are we again? Right, so perceptually, the story is told what's going on. It's just very hard to analytically extract it and express it. So, uh, yeah, bear with me if, if I talk too recursively. Now, um, yeah, I cannot write down perception states, and I also don't want to, since I think that recursive perception states are so natural for us to be in that they become transparent to us, and we often don't see them clearly in their structure anymore. Now, Jesus, um, now what I wanted uh, to get at with all the train models and the regulations, of course, that if you want to control anything, you need a model of the thing you want to control. If you want to control the economy, you know, you have to know how, how it's working somehow, otherwise you can't make a change. If you want to control a complex engine, you need to know which screw causes which thing to happen. If you want to catch a ball, you need a model of the trajectory of the ball. Anything that you want to regulate, you need some kind of model. That's clear. Regulate an environment, need a model of this environment. Regulate your own internal state, need a model of your own internal state. Regulate your interactions with the environment, need a model of the interaction loop between the environment. Now the thing is, in an evolutionary environment, under the conditions of resource scarcity, modeling systems, observing systems, have to make models efficiently because model making is expensive. Which means that they have to make sure that the models are being made in a very specific way. They need to regulate the model making process. In order to regulate something, you need a model of this thing. So now they need a model of the model making process in order to regulate the way in which they make models, right? And I think here you can already see the ghost of recursion uh, creeping in, right? Which I think in some sense might be us. Um, the system starts to make models of its model making process in order to regulate it. But of course, the modeling of the model making process is part of the model making process, right? So it will end up modeling the modeling of the model making process. That's what will happen automatically. And of course it can go on forever, but it's not interesting because you got recursion after three loops and everything beyond that is just the model of a model of a model. And we are also computationally bounded, so it doesn't really work. And the system making this doesn't make this analytically like when we think about it right now. It has to do this in the perception language that's already there. So this should be 
just represented in the perceptual language already. And yeah, maybe take a moment for some introspection. What is happening right now? Everything you look at, me for example, or something else, or in, in your own mind, is already experientially tagged in some way as currently being observed. That's always the case when you have an imagination, an intuition, or you look at something. It's always already tagged as being wanted right now, right? So you use different words normally when you think about this, but it's always there. Now the thing is, it's not just the case that these things are being tagged as currently being modeled, so it's not just represented that we have observations, but the modeling of the model-making process, so to speak, the observing is also modeled. So consciousness goes a step further. Consciousness is not just looking at something that is tagged as currently being observed. Consciousness is looking at the looking. Self-reflexive would be uh, looking at how you look at the looking. So once again, look around. You're not just looking at something right now, which is tagged as currently being looked at. The looking itself is represented as well. Phenomena are not just being looked at, but the looking is also a phenomenon that is being looked at. And that's why there can be the experience of observing something in the first place. And I don't mean this as an object or a thing, right? It's just that if you look at your, the entirety of your perceptual experience, somehow it's, it is encoded in there, without even thinking about it, that you're looking at the process of looking. It seems to have some gestalt. It's not clearly pinpointed. It's very hard to kind of see it clearly, but it is there in this perceptual language. You don't need to reason about it. It's automatically there. And, and yeah, it's our common state, right? We are always aware of the fact, or we always contain information about the fact, that we observe ourselves observing. And I would say, perceptually speaking, this third order model makes up the fundamental gestalt of our subjective experience. And I also think it's somehow a dynamical structure that's never completely stable, maybe because these loops are going on, but not too far. So I think that's why this is this vague, evasive, ever-present percept of self-reflexive attention that's going on with us as observers. That's always there, and that's also sometimes what people from um, different schools of meditation um, talk about. Metzinger calls this reines bewusstsein, pure consciousness. Um, and of course, as I said, the looking is not represented as some object. Um, in a more ethereal manner. So it's a certain gestalt that the mind models. Namely, I would say it's the gestalt of perceiving. And to me, the best way to express it with natural language, to express how I have it in my head, is that this is the feeling of what it's like. Observing the gestalt of looking. Or in other words, perceiving, perceiving. And note, of course, that all of this is still nothing beyond patterns and appearances constructed from information. That's very important. Functionally speaking, consciousness is a collection of patterns. The gestalt of looking is a pattern. Also experientially speaking, it is pattern. Your experience has a certain structure. If it hadn't that structure, it would not be your experience. It is purely defined by the structure. If it had another structure, it would be a completely different experience. That's very important. So it's not that I give you information and then I talk about something evasive and I say in the end it can be mapped. It is always the same thing. What, at least I mean it that way. That's very important. Feels like something is an appearance. Right? What else is it? Of course it's an appearance, but it's not a single appearance that you can like pinpoint in the space model that you have or whatever. Yeah. So once again, I think observing the gestalt of looking is what makes up the gestalt of your experience right now. And any content that you have is wrapped into that gestalt already. Um, yeah, so some of the summary of this trip through philosophy of mind would be you need epistemology, discrete finite sets of differences, plus meaning as the model relationship of bits of information to all other model bits of information, the discovery of the self as a simplified statistical model of a regulating principle found in the data, and then consciousness as the recursively constructed dynamical percept of the gestalt of looking at the looking. And this QR code leads to this text that I wrote on that. It's, uh, I think, way more detailed, and there I managed to express what I wanted to express. It's just a WeTransfer upload. It's not published or anything. I wrote it for myself. If you're interested, give it a read and give me some feedback. And uh, yeah, that was my, my talk on, on what I think consciousness is. Thank you. Thank you.